Thank you, Lord, for a beautiful way to begin the service, reminding us of how great our God is. Thank you for joining us today for worship, uh, live stream, and Facebook Live. We continue to do what we're asked to do. And uh, again, I to tell you that we miss you. We'd love to have you all back here, but we will work on that and, and uh, come up with a plan at some point in time. But thank you for joining us the way you are today. We invite you to worship with us, and we pray that you feel God's presence as we worship Him together today. Join me today as we sing together, God of our Fathers.
Amen. What a powerful and beautiful song that we stand with our faith and trust in the Lord. And there is power in His love and we don't have to be afraid. And thank you so much for worshiping with us today and for allowing us to come into your home and into your family room or on your deck or on your back porch or maybe you're worshiping out in your car. But thank you so much for worshiping with us today. And every week we have a great time of prayer together. A time again where you can humble yourself before Almighty God and, and ask Him to help you and to heal you and direct you, to save you, to forgive you, however the Holy Spirit leads. We give Him praise and glory and honor, but we also cry out to Him in our need. And certainly this is a very special weekend and we remember all of those who have gone on before us those that have served in any branch of our armed forces, we say thank you for your sacrifice. We remember family members and friends that have gone on before us. We remember you and the impact you had on our lives and continue to have on the legacy that you've left behind. But I'm going to invite you at this time, if you would, to just join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. May we pray. Oh God, thank you so much that today you are the way and the truth and the life and that no one comes to the Father except through you. Thank you today, Lord, that we do not have to fear because there is power in your love and in your mercy and in your grace. And Father, we have come at this time to worship you, to glorify you, to magnify the name of Jesus to exalt the name that is above all names. Father, today we remember those loved ones who have gone on before us. We remember grandparents or parents or siblings and Lord, even in some cases, children. Lord, we remember those men and women who have fought and served to bring us freedom in our country. Thank you, Father, for all of those who have served in any branch of our armed forces. Thank you for their sacrifice so that we might enjoy the freedom in our nation. And Father, we just pray today for so many who are on our hearts. We have folks that are grieving over the loss of loved ones. Comfort them. Oh God, strengthen them, especially on this Memorial Day weekend. Oh God, we pray for folks that are in the hospital. We have so many, God, that have had surgeries and are recovering, and we pray for healing for those, oh God, maybe that have upcoming surgeries. Anoint them with your Holy Spirit and your healing power. Father, we continue to pray for our country and we pray God for healing and we pray for healing around the world from this coronavirus. Oh God, we are so eager to get back to life as we know it, being able to, to go to work or to be around friends and, and Lord to be back in church together worshiping you. But we're grateful, Father, for the technology that has allowed us to minister to more people, even than normal, through this time of quarantine. And Father, we give you praise for this opportunity to minister to people. Lord, we just pray again for all those who are on the front lines and ask for your protection. Lord, we just pray today that if there are those watching that are lonely or depressed or feel isolated, are lost without you, that you would bring them comfort and hope and encouragement and Lord, salvation. And we pray for great revival and spiritual awakening to come from all of this craziness. Lord, just help me and us to follow your lead and when you would have us to open our doors, to reopen the doors so people can come and worship together. 
Father, give us a peace that comes from our faith and trust in you. Father, we want to do what's right. We want to do what's going to be best for everyone and to glorify and honor you. So help us, O oh God, and be with us through this service. And may your Holy Spirit continue to move and Father, sing through Haley in just a moment and use her, God, as an instrument of your peace and love and speak through the power of your word and your servant that we all might be drawn closer to you. And we'll give you all the praise and the glory and the honor for the victories we trust you to bring. In the strong and holy and powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. This morning before I read the scripture, I'm grateful that, that one of our students, Haley Martin, is here to sing for us. Haley always does a beautiful job, and thank you, Haley, for using your talents and gifts to glorify the Lord and to minister to all of us. And after the reading of God's word, Haley will be coming. Be in prayer for Haley as she sings. Begin with verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, a great passage, especially for this holiday weekend. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This is the word of the Lord, and blessed be the name of the Lord.
a Colosseum or an amphitheater where these heroes of faith, these past heroes that were mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, that hero or faith hall of fame, as they are cheering on the spiritual contestants who are now running the race. And they are encouraging you and me to keep the faith as we are living. It seems as though the Hebrew writer knew that in the future there was going to be persecution. And so he was encouraging not only those folks at this time, but you and me to keep on keeping on. That even though we were in this race, and even though there are challenging times, we are to keep the faith, to keep going, even when circumstances are difficult. And when you look at all those different folks in, in Hebrews chapter 11, we are encouraged. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, it says, By faith Noah, when warned about things yet not seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, it says, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place that he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. They had faith and trust in God, even when they did not know what the future held in store for them. That's kind of like you and me, isn't it? We must have faith for those things that we don't understand or what tomorrow holds. I've shared so many times that a scripture that I've grown to love through the years, it's, it's written on this concrete under this hardwood, under this pulpit, Hebrews 11, 6, and without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists, and He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Are you earnestly seeking the Lord today? Do you have faith that God is going to help you and to help me as these living and active witnesses are cheering us on from the stands? Yesterday, I, I went for a jog or a run. I, throughout this whole time of quarantine and coronavirus, I, I hope as you as well, has. I've kept exercising. I've told you before my family, we would go on family walks and many times even after a family walk or before a family walk, I would try to jog. And I had gotten away from running as much as I used to, but I've tried to start jogging two miles, uh, maybe two miles and a quarter. I was trying to work my way back up to three or four miles. Well, yesterday was a beautiful day and I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go running and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot for my three miles. I'm going to get back up to my three miles. And so I went running. I have to tell you, when I was coming up the hill in front of my house, after that second mile was coming to a close, I began, I honestly did, I began to pray, God, if I'm going to run another mile, you're going to have to help me because I am feeling it. It is burning. The sun was shining, it was bright, sweat was going in my eyes, and I did. Now that might seem silly to you, but we are to pray in everything or in all things. So I was praying, Lord, you're going to have to help me if you want me to make it this third mile. And so as I got up the hill and I passed my house, I was feeling a little bit better. And then wouldn't you know, the sun went in her cloud. And I was like... Praise the Lord, there's a cloud, and it may not. For that entire third mile, right as I got up the hill in front of my house, completing, the sun popped back out. But that third mile, I ran with the shade or with the cloud over the sun. And I was thanking God for the sun. And then as I walked on down the street just to cool off, I heard thunder in the distance, and a big thunder cloud, and then lightning in the distance. And so I was able to get safely home after surviving the sun and my weariness and the storm 
And it just reminded me of God's faithfulness. You remember, He led the children of Israel out of their slavery and out of their bondage with a cloud by day and a fire by night. He was faithful to them. And I believe with all my heart, God is still faithful to you and me. Some of you are here and some of you are watching that maybe you've been tempted to give up. Maybe you are tired of all these guidelines and restrictions of the coronavirus. Uh, you miss life as we remember it. You are tired. You are ready just to go on with your life. Maybe you're tempted to revert back to some of your old habits. How many of you have made promises during this season of quarantine and coronavirus? You've made commitments that I'm going to be different. I'm going to be a better husband. I'm going to be a better a wife. I'm going to be a better parent. I'm going to be a better child. I'm going to be a better employee. I'm going to be a better employer. I'm going to be a better Christian. And then how many of us, when we are able to get back to business as usual, are going to go right back to our own ways? How many of us are going to have the faith to say, God, you help me get through this rough season? And I've got faith that you're going to help me continue to be the follower of Christ that you would have me to be. We learn from these past heroes that they had great faith, but they also had fortitude. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, it says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. That means when it's time to run, we must take off our warm-up suits. And this time to discard the flowing robes. To get rid of anything that might entangle us or trip us up. Any excess weight, any bulk, anything that might hinder us from running freely, we are to get rid of. What sin or what thing might be tripping you up today? Is there something in your life that's tripping you up? And you know it is. You know you are not running as as well as you could because of something tripping you up. Is it possibly a critical spirit or a judgmental spirit? Could it be that, that it's anger that's tripping you up? Is it overconfidence or pride? Could it be anger? Could it be unforgiveness? What's tripping you up today and keeping you from being your best? Well, I think about the definition of fortitude is when we are able to uh, run with strength or bravery or courage in the face of adversity or pain. When you have fortitude, you keep on going even when the odds are stacked against you. And that's what these heroes of faith model that they were able to keep on keeping on. But you know, when we have these things that trip us up, we have the responsibility to get rid of them, to give them to God. Because when we don't, you know what happens? We breathe the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 30 to 32, Paul wrote, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as in Christ, God forgave you. That's what we are called to do, to get rid of that excess baggage, that excess bull, that excess Sin that keeps tripping us up and hindering us from running with perseverance. In Acts chapter 20, verse 24, a Paul said, However, I do not consider my life worth living 
but only that I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Isn't that a beautiful passage? Paul said, I, I don't consider my life even worth living, but here's why I'm here. The reason I'm here is that I'm going to finish this race and I'm going to complete the task the Lord has given me. And it was to testify to the gospel of God's grace. And I pray you would be encouraged today to have that fortitude. That's what Paul meant when he said in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things, everything through Christ who gives me strength. That's how we persevere. We keep on keeping on with His power, supernatural power that comes from the Holy Spirit. But just yesterday morning when I got up, I, I was uh, in the kitchen fixing some breakfast. I looked out the back window and I saw a neighbor uh, back across the back of our uh, house across the street who was helping another neighbor trim their trees. Well, what made this so remarkable to me when you talk about fortitude was just a couple of weeks ago when I was out in my yard, one of the neighbors who happens to live across the street from this neighbor, you follow me, who lives across the street from this neighbor came up to me and he said, did you hear what happened to such and such? And I said, no, I, I didn't. So what's going on? I said, his wife went to the doctor. And while she was at a doctor's appointment, she had a heart attack and died at the doctor's office. I said, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I didn't hear that. I'm, I'm so, so sorry. He said, yeah, he just came over and told me she's gone. And I said, well, I'm, I am so sorry. And I said, I, I'll be praying for him and so just a, a day or two after that, our family, we had been out for an evening drive. We'd done a lot of walking and a lot of evening drives together. And we saw him out in his yard and I stopped and I called him by name and, and I said, I'd love to have a prayer with you. I'm so sorry for your loss. This gentleman who's in his 80s, who suffers from health issues of his own, Grieving over the loss of it, I watched out my back window him trimming the trees of a much younger couple's house and then getting his chainsaw and cutting them up for them. And I thought, that, that is strength in adversity. That is strength in pain. That he was thinking about someone else even during his grief and during his loss. That's what some of you have been doing. Some of you have been making masks for people. Some of you have been making food for people. And some of you have been praying for others, thinking about others during this time of, of adversity and pain. Ministers, not only to the people you're ministering to, but also ministers to each one of us as well. But we learn from these past heroes of faith, that yes, they had great faith, they had fortitude, but they also had focus. They had focus. If we would read on in verse 2 of Hebrews chapter 12, it says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the, the author or pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. It said, let us consider him who did not uh, grow weary and lose heart, but that we would continue to run this race. And I'm so thankful today that we can fix our eyes on Jesus. Just as a runner runs a race, they are focusing on finishing the race. Like when I was out running, I was focused on getting back home. Still able to walk, still able to breathe, still able to run. We are to fix our eyes on Jesus, just as a runner focuses on the finish line. Jesus has been at the beginning of the race, 
and at the end. He's already run the race. He's close to finish line. He's broken the tape. And that's what we are to do as followers of Christ. The way we get through adversity and pain and coronavirus and everything else in this life is we fix our eyes upon Jesus Christ. But maybe you're here watching today and, and maybe you're focused on other things. Maybe you're focused on your problems. You're focused more on this virus. Well, I love what John said in 1 John chapter 4. Greater is the one that is in us than he that is in the world, or it that is in the world. We don't have to focus on our problems because God is greater. Or maybe you're focused on other people. People are imperfect. If you're looking for a person to save you, you're going to be sadly disappointed. People can't save. That only comes from Jesus. And Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says, Salvation comes from no one else. There is no other name given to men whereby we must be saved. It's Jesus, the name of Jesus. Maybe you're here and, or you're watching and you've been focused on your possessions. Well, Jesus said, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where rust and moth does destroy and thieves break in and steal, but rather lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where rust and moth do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. Or maybe you are focused on position, about climbing the ladder and being a person in power or, or getting position. Did Jesus not say, whoever humbles themselves will be exalted? And so we know today that we must focus on Jesus as we run this race. I also think about a scripture I shared this past Wednesday night out of Philippians chapter 3, 12 and 13. He said, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, which is Christ's likeness. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward which is ahead, which God calls me heavenward through Christ Jesus. I press on to the goal which God calls me heavenward through Christ Jesus. And do we know that Paul finished the race? Absolutely. Second Timothy chapter 4, 7 and 8. He said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, not only to me, but to all those who have longed for His appearing. I don't know about you, but that's a great example for me that when we stay in the race and we fight the good fight for the kingdom of God, that we will be blessed with an eternal crown of righteousness that comes from faith in the Lord. Again, maybe you have just been exhausted like that. And I think there's not one of us that are not tired of all this crazy. I mean, it has just been unreal. Never dreamed that we would not be in a church building, even though, again, I want to remind you, we are the church wherever we are. We're the body of Christ. Never dreamed for 10 weeks, or I guess maybe 11 weeks, we, we wouldn't be meeting together. I, I never dreamed that. But that's a reality of where we are. And I never dreamed that we would be experiencing some of the things we're going through. But know that God can use this to grow us in our relationship with Him. Or to, you know, either, either couples are closer to each other than they've ever been. Or there's going to be a long line for divorce court after all this craziness. But I'm praying that people are growing closer to one another. And loving one another like they've never loved before. Because I think about the freedom that we have. Not as, I want to just tell you all this. This is just from my heart. I, I have not, as a pastor or a Christian, felt like my religious liberty has been threatened through this. I would be the first one to march and protest if I felt like I was being persecuted 
And some people have said, well, it's amazing how they can have 500 at Walmart or 500 at Lowe's. And I said, well, they're not hugging each other and singing at Walmart and Lowe's either. And they're not sitting shoulder to shoulder in Walmart and Lowe's. But I said, we are the body of Christ wherever we are. And we want to get it right by keeping you safe. But I am reminded of a story maybe that I shared with you a few years ago. It's a powerful story. In September of 2005, uh, Martha Cothran, who was a social studies teacher at Robinson High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, talked about MTI, non-traditional instruction. I mean, have you been receiving already emails and and one calls for uh, surveying for next school season, you know, would you be uh, content to do a non-traditional instruction or, or partly virtual, partly in part, you know, all these surveys were filling out for the next school year. Well, Martha Cothran had certainly some uh, non-traditional instruction. It was the first day of school in September of 2005, Robinson High School, her students came into first period and there were no desks in the, in the classroom. And they said, Ms. Cochran, where, where are the desks? She said, you will get a desk when you can tell me how you earn them. So some kids began to spat out, when we make good grades? She said, no. Said, when we have good behavior? She said, no. And then they had several other guests. Well, first period came and went. No child could answer. Second period came and went. Third period came and went. No one could tell her how to earn those deaths. By early afternoon, news uh, teams had gotten word that they were there videoing and went to see why this crazy teacher had taken the desk out of the classroom and and so people were asking what she had had the approval of the superintendent and the principal and the building supervisor. They had allowed her to move the desk out. It was the last period of the day and children were sitting around the edges of the classroom with the backs against the wall. And she said, no one can tell me how you earn these debts. She goes, the time has come for you to find out how these deaths have been earned. She went to the door and opened up the door and 27 veterans in full uniform came walking in, each one carrying a desk. And they placed those desks in rows and they went over and stood silently to the side. For the first time in those children's lives, they could understand how those deaths were earned. Miss Cochran looked at her class and she said, you can't earn these deaths because these folks earned them for you. They paid the price and they sacrificed so that you would have the freedom to sit in these deaths and to learn. And through that, those young people's lives were transformed and she said, now, nah, you have the responsibility to learn and to be a good student and to be a good citizen. Don't take for granted the freedom that you have been given. When I thought about that, it touched my heart to thank those men and women who have sacrificed to give us the freedom that we have. And I couldn't help but think about Jesus who endured such opposition from sinful people so that we would not grow weary and lose heart. The sacrifice that He made so that we might have the responsibility as followers of Christ to, to learn His Word and to be good kingdom citizens and to make a difference in the world in which we live. We thank God for our freedom. We thank God for the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who loved us unconditionally, sacrificially, so that we might be set free from our sin. And today you can experience that freedom. 
And I pray that if you've never given your heart and life fully surrendered to Jesus, may this be a Memorial Day weekend you would remember forever. The time when you accepted Christ into your heart, confessed your sin, asked Him to forgive you of your sin. Or maybe you're a Christian already, but you've grown weary, and you've been sitting on the side instead of getting in the game. We need all Christians, all hands on deck, to carry the message of Christ to a world where people need the Lord. Or maybe you've been wanting to join a church family. As I've been sharing, we've had folks joining over the last several weeks, even though we've not met in person. We have people accepting Christ, awaiting baptism, people that are moving church letters. We have people that are still making decisions for Christ. Won't you be a part today of the great work God is doing, even now, as we pray together? Oh God, I pray right now in the stillness of this moment that as folks are worshiping and watching wherever they might be, in this state or in another state, or, or maybe, again, they're, they're out of town for the weekend, wherever they might be, I pray that they can feel the Holy Spirit and they would know that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we thank you for men and women who sacrifice their lives to give us freedom in this country. And we thank you most of all, Lord, for your sacrifice. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. That whoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Thank you, Father, for loving us that much and for that ultimate sacrifice. And I pray, Lord, that there would be many who would invite you to come into their hearts and lives. Even now, in the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to, to sing along. This is a time of commitment. This is a, uh, a hymn of commitment and decision. As the Holy Spirit leads you, I invite you to follow Christ as we run this race together.
And again, for Bill and those in the sound booth, thank you all for being here, for making this possible. We ask that you would continue to pray as we seek God's guidance moving forward. To be honest with you, just to wait to see how some of these churches that are reopening, how successful they are, and to see if there's a spike in cases. Or, But again, please know our number one goal is to keep everyone safe. I mean, maybe you've not been here for the last 10 weeks. We've been here every Sunday trying to minister to you and love you again as much as we can from a distance. And so we are praying for God's will and for direction. And, and as soon as we get a clear time or date, we will let you know. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your faithfulness, for your support and your continued giving. We couldn't do without you. And again, we are, we are open for the Lord's leading in this matter. So thank you so much. I pray that you have a blessed Memorial Day and time with family. You will not be receiving discussion questions today. Again, just have a special time with your family. And, and again, if you want to discuss the message, Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, feel free to do that. But thank you for worshiping. God bless you. And as we hear so often, God bless America. Bill, would you close us in song?